Welcome to Goober Town Hobbies. My name is Brent, and today I'm gonna paint a random mini with a random paint scheme. So I've got my treasure bin here. It's got a ton of random minis in there, all individually packaged. I'm gonna reach in and pick out something special. This feels special to me. Whole episode rests on this pull. Moment of truth. <laughs> Can you see this? This is one incarnation of the white dwarf. That's a classic. Okay, I feel really good about this pull. The other half of Goobertown Roulette, though, is I need to roll some dice to figure out what the, uh, the rest of the challenge is. So, first up on the list is I need to roll a die to figure out the theme of this mini. I got a five. That is punk or steampunk. Some kind of punk. Could be cyberpunk. We'll think about it. Next dice, next die, is color. Main color of the white dwarf is brown, beige, black, or white. So the, the neutral colors were all in here. And this is for painting uh, style or um, you know special challenge. And here we go. This could be a really big deal. Three. Weathering techniques. Okay, okay. As far as these challenges went, that is uh, that is easy. So. I'm feeling really good about this pull. Let's get to it. Here he is, our punky little white dwarf. A truly fine model with a truly fine beard. He's got an axe to be proud of and a helmet full of brew. I can paint this fine fellow with neutral colors and I can weather him, but how the heck am I gonna make him look punk? My touchstones for cyberpunk are Blade Runner and Altered Carbon. Rainy cityscapes with lots of neon light. Dark futures for humanity where the characters are grim and imperfect. A Necromunda character would have been great for Cyberpunk, but this figure is a dwarf and he seems to be celebrating. Let's table Cyberpunk and think about Steampunk. Whether it's fair or not, when I think of Steampunk, I think of the movie Wild Wild West. Clocks and gears and giant metal spiders. The genre also has airships and whimsical tech that shouldn't work, but somehow it does. Dwarfs fit much better into this punk genre with their forges and cannons and gyrocopters. Another example of punk is Tank Girl, an exuberant character who drives a crazy, heavily modified tank. That'll do, punk. That'll do. Tank Dwarf is definitely a possibility. The vehicle would serve as his base, and it would connect the model to the theme, and it would give me something to weather. I'll probably want to do some conversion, but I can certainly see him standing on the hull of a modified Rhino or a Land Raider. It'd be cool to have this dwarf sticking his head out of a hatch or a turret on one of those tanks. I really want to find a way to do that, but I don't want to do anything extreme like cutting this classic metal model in half. Then I found the piece that I needed. This is from an old GW terrain kit, and it was the base for a turret or something. Here's the magic. The round opening on the top is wide enough for a 25mm base. We can have the dwarf sticking out of a hatch without cutting into that beautiful metal sculpt or cutting into one of those tanks. So let's think about using this thing as a turret or an observation post on a tank. One possibility is this original rhino that I got off of eBay. Maybe. I've also got an old land raider from Craigslist. Maybe. And a longtime viewer named James sent me this Rhino chassis. It could definitely be cool for this project, but I've got other plans. It's time to reveal the winner. This is the Kangaroo APC from Victoria Miniatures. I've had this sitting around for a while now, and it seems like the time has finally come. In this orientation, the alternate turret looks pretty great. Our dwarf will fit right in there and look amazing. His punky battle tank will be rolling towards the enemy while he's drinking out of a helmet and waving his axe around. Yep, we've found it. This is gonna be excellent. 
I modified the inside of the turret by putting in a plastic tube and a bottom. This will neatly hold 25mm bases. I can put some spare bases into the tube as spacers to get the dwarf sticking out at exactly the right height. I found some washers just the right size to mate with an indentation in the main body of the tank. The turret is just held on there by gravity, but it's a solid connection that still lets me pivot the turret. To make this punky, let's give the dwarf an absolutely silly amount of firepower. I've got some metal Gatling guns that I think were part of an old Land Raider kit. I got them cleaned up and mounted onto the turret. Our dwarf is going to have four Gatling guns. Amazing. It's crazy and punky and I'm loving it. It just feels right. I found some bits from a plastic Dwarfen Warriors kit and I went looking for ways to decorate this tank. Heads, axes, banners, and shields are all options for decorating this turret. In the end, I went with the top of a banner pole and a couple of shields to give a nice dwarfy look. Next up, I had to make a hard decision. Whether or not to put a ridiculous smokestack on the front of this tank. The best reason to do it is that it's silly and it would totally sell the steampunk theme. I could also make some smoke coming out of there and do some fun, sooty weathering. As for reasons not to put a smokestack on there, well, it would definitely get shot up by those Gatling guns. It would also distract from the dwarf as the main event of this model. Sometimes I have to remind myself that it's the dwarf that I actually drew from the treasure bin. I'm A-OK -okay giving him a tank as an accessory and a plinth and a decorative base, but I do want the dwarf and the turret to be the focal point of this piece. One last reason not to stick this awesome smokestack onto the hull is that I think it would be cool to convert between serious sci-fi tank and crazy dwarven punk tank by just switching out the turrets. So I guess I'm gonna forgo this smokestack and leave the hull of the tank nice and vanilla. Something that's really tickling me about this design is how modular it is. I can work on the tank, the turret, and the dwarf separately, and then I can put them all together at any point to see how it's going. Alright, it is finally time to paint this dwarf. I'm planning on mostly neutral colors since that's what we rolled. I did choose to give him a red beard though. The technique challenge today is weathering, so I figure we'll be getting a ton of browns and grays onto the model no matter what, so I should be allowed to start the base coat with a little bit of color. The tank is going to be an awesome place to go to town on weathering, and for the dwarf himself, we'll do the best that we can. I'll be sure to give his axe and his leather plenty of scratches and wear. I'm also thinking that he'll get a layer of soot towards the end of the paint job. I'm working in the rest of the base colors and I'm getting to know this model. Everything after the beard is a neutral color. I'm mostly relying on the tank for the punk theme, but there's no reason not to paint the gems in his beard as little clocks. The shortest route towards steampunk is to just put stupid clocks everywhere. Alrighty, this dwarf is wearing a lot of leather, and that's a prime place to work in some weathering techniques. I've got a couple of shades of light, yellowy-brown colors as highlights for the deep brown leather. In addition to highlighting some edges and folds, I'm also making some random lines as scratches, and I'm dotting and stippling in some random scuffs. After that first layer of damage is when I applied a dark wash to the leather. That'll help blend in some of that wear and tear. After the wash is dry, I can come back in with those highlight colors and add fresh damage. I think the layered effect helps to sell this as old, well-used gear. Let's add some details and see how this dwarf is shaping up. Eyes, teeth, and clocks. Sometimes when I'm painting, I'm relaxed and not thinking about much at all. At other times, my mind is cranking through awesome ideas and making crazy plans. Well, I just had a wonderful and silly idea. I'm gonna give him a layer of soot but I'm gonna protect his eyes and maybe some of his hair like he was wearing goggles as he was cruising through the wasteland. Okay, I tried to set the clocks to the same minute, but different hours. This is a worldly dwarf. He's keeping track of when the markets open in Bretonia, Mordheim, and the World's Edge Mountains. Steampunk is so silly. For the axe, I gave it a rough highlight with a silver far brighter than the base color of the metal. I find that this is a quick way to make the metal look old and worn, while still giving the axe a sharp, dangerous edge. I came back with a light brown for a final round of highlights and damage on the leather. 
The gear this dwarf is wearing has been through a lot, and it shows cracks and scuffs from many years of use. Weathering is fun, and we've now come to one of the best parts. I'm getting some final shots of the dwarf at this stage, because I'm about to throw a pile of soot at him. First, I protected the inside of his mouth and circles around his eyes with blue tack poster putty. When he rides through dust storms, he's normally smart enough to put on a pair of goggles and close his mouth. I thought of protecting the top of his head as if he wears a helmet too. But nah, this helmet isn't for wearing. It's for drinking. I've got some ash gray pigment powder from Secret Weapon that I'm gonna chuck at this dwarf. His front side above the waist is gonna be covered in dust and soot. I'm patting that in there to get him nice and dusty. Oh yeah, this guy has been driving through smoke, soot, and dust. Let's peel off the putty and see what we've got here. Now the model doesn't have goggles, but these raccoon eyes are definitely gonna give the impression that he wears goggles sometimes. And we all know that there's nothing more punk than goggles. Oh yeah, this is gonna do nicely. We are off to a great start. Let's get going on this tank. First, I've gotta pick a color to prime with. I don't paint tanks much, so I thought it would be fun to go with a classic green. I've got two choices for primer. NATO green and Russian green. Look, this orange dwarf with the raccoon eyes is a complete maniac, but he's not a shameful traitor. He's not embarrassingly beholden to the Russian mob, so his tank is gonna be NATO green. NATO green versus Russian green. Easiest choice ever. I got the tank primed up with a flat coat of NATO green. This tank is gonna be a testing ground for a ton of different weathering techniques. I'm going to put down a simple base coat, and then hit the whole thing with a pile of weathering strategies and see what happens. I painted the treads tire black, which is a nice blue-black color from Secret Weapon. Then I painted a few other bits in this color, primarily the guns. In addition to painting the custom dwarf turret, I'm painting the turret that came with the tank from Victoria Miniatures as well. I'm tickled by the idea of being able to switch back and forth from normal tank to punk dwarf tank. The only other base coat color that I'm going to put on the tank is copper for the dwarf and shields. I started with an undercoat of brown, and then put down some thin copper metallic paint. Alright, we've got a very basic paint job here that we're going to weather in all kinds of different ways. I went and watched a few videos from various scale modelers to get pumped up for this step. Some of the hobbyists out there painting tanks do some really mind-blowing stuff. I went on a learning binge, and then made a list of techniques to adapt and then try for myself. I started with a video from a guy called Panzermeister, and let me tell you, that is a fun rabbit hole. When I came back, I had some ideas, and I was ready to weather this tank. I started by pinwashing all the cracks and seams and bolts on this vehicle. I'm using black and brown oil paint, heavily thinned with mineral spirits. This oil wash is great at getting down inside those cracks. In the areas where I'm able to be neat and tidy, this will add shading and definition. And if I color outside the lines, well then it's oil, dirt, and weathering. Win, win, win. And here we are after a reasonably careful round of pin washing. It looks pretty good as a generic tank, but it looks great as a dwarfen tank. From here on, we've got a bunch of options. Chips and scratches in the paint, rust, dirt and mud, scorch marks, blast marks, soot. This stuff all builds up. I had to think about what order to use in layering all of these imperfections. Let's do chips in the paint. I got a lighter shade of green, and I started sponging it around. Anywhere on the tank can be scuffed up, but I'm going a bit heavier on the exposed edges. This method is one that I saw several scale modelers doing using both a highlight color and a shade color of the base layer to make a chipped paint effect. First, the lighter shade. It can be sponged or painted on. After a sponge layer, I switched to a brush to make a few targeted scrapes and scratches. I also used the brush to reinforce some of the damage that I started with the sponge. Next, I switched to a much darker green. This is a common trick that makes the damage look more three-dimensional and more real. For the darker color, I'm always putting it alongside or overlapping where I have light colored marks. I'm not using the sponge at all for the dark. I'm being more precise with this round, 
always making sure that the dark green corresponds with some light green. Again, I did the main hull of the tank along with the two turrets, all in parallel, and both variants are looking pretty good. Next up, let's make some rust patches. For this I got brown, red, and orange oil paints all mixed up with a bit of mineral spirits. I'm going to use this mixture to make some rusty streaks. I picked a handful of spots on the tank to be places where some rust has taken hold. In some ways it's probably true that less is more, but throwing on these rust streaks is a lot of fun, and it was a struggle to rein myself in. Alright, the treads are going to be scuffed up from grinding over rocks. They'll be exposing some shiny metal, so let's give them a quick dry brush with a steel color. While I was at it, I also dry brushed the guns a bit to give them some wear and tear. Now let's put a scorch mark on the tank, like it was hit with some fire that didn't quite pierce the armor. I've got some dark metallic pigment powder that I'm going to dab on. I wanted to use black pigment powder, but I seem to have lost that in my hobby desk somewhere, so dark metallic it is. I'm just dabbing it on in a big blast mark. Next, I layered on some grey ash to give it a bit more variety. This is the same grey that I used on the face of the dwarf, and I'm going to use it on the exhaust pipes in the back of the tank too. I've been trying to work from the oldest wear to the most recent, and now we've come to the point where we just throw on mud. I've got some brown pigment here, and I'm cramming it into the treads. I want the whole underside of this caked in mud. I'll throw on a few random spots higher up as well. This pigment powder is messy, but it's totally worth it. The overall look of this tank is really coming together. I would absolutely believe that this war machine has been doing donuts in the mud, cruising through battlefields, and dishing out the pain. This is the first vehicle that I've ever tried to paint like a scale model nerd, and I can really see the appeal. I didn't worry about shadows and highlights, I just put down a flat coat of nato green and then jumped in to weather it up. I'm just barely dipping a toe into the scale modeling world here, but the water's warm. This is fun. So here's a weathered kangaroo APC from Victoria Miniatures. The time has come for the dwarf to throw on his custom punk turret and mount up. We'll see how that turns out right after a word from our sponsors. Today's episode is sponsored by all the Goobertown patrons. I appreciate the heck out of you goobers. And of course today is also a celebration of the third season of Goobertown Roulette. The contestants picked random minis in their own way and then rolled the same challenge dice that I did. It looks like the Resonator had a very familiar method for picking his mini, but I won't spoil it for you. The participants rolled for theme and main color, and then optionally rolled an extra technique challenge die and a secondary color die. As you'll see, this silly challenge inspired a ton of truly incredible work. This episode took me a little longer than normal to put together because I agonize over whose work to feature. Judging art is hard, and the fact that this is a fun silly challenge actually makes the judging more difficult, not easier. For example, should I handicap the returning champions a little bit? Is it fair that they get featured every time just because they keep doing awesome work and sending in photos that make me smile? Should I allow bright bold colors to grab my attention? I do love bright colors. And what about really great paint jobs on minis that make me feel a bit uncomfortable? Should certain challenges and dice rolls get more attention than others? There were some really great 90 minute paint jobs in the batch. There were also some outstanding personal best style paint jobs where time wasn't an issue at all. And don't even get me started on the dioramas. There were a lot of awesome dioramas. All this is to say that I'm overwhelmed with how many excellent entries we got for this season of Goobertown Roulette. Fate can lead us to hobby in some pretty fun directions. In the spirit of Goobertown Roulette, to break the ice, I used a random number generator to pick the first few entries to feature. Kayan's Crick's Kraken needed to be red, purple, and edge highlighted to infinity. The dice required that the piece also needed to evoke melancholy and deep thought. Check out the woman hiding behind a tombstone near the rim of the base. She adds so much context. How did it come to this? How did we allow our machines to overthrow us? We spent so long asking if we could, but we never gave any thought to whether we should. Paul, aka Zombie Guts, gave us this creepy purple Goobertown demon. 
this challenge was all about giving it your absolute best. Paul confessed that the selection of this mini wasn't exactly random, but for how much time and love they put into the paint job, I think we'll let it slide. The longer you look at this, the more detail you see, and the creepier it gets. The purplish skin looks great, and this whole thing is beautiful and spooky. Alright, I'm finally ready to call out some of my favorites that show off what this painting roulette is all about. KP drew a historical tank from their collection and rolled Purple Underdog. On Earth, a purple tank doesn't quite look right, so KP solved that riddle by putting the tank on an alien planet battling giant monsters. All of a sudden, a real Leopard 2 tank looks perfectly reasonable as a purple underdog. Bravo! Zodgrod by Destro is another underdog, but he's a blue underdog and he has some beautiful freestyle banners. Orcs are so thick-headed that it's kinda hard to make them into an underdog, but this battlefield setting is strewn with the remains of much scarier warriors and creatures, and Zodgrod here isn't exactly leading a squad of knobs. The Gretchen here under Zodgrod's command may not be the toughest, but they've got spunk and they've got awesome banners. Gwynor also did some freehand painting on the shield of this whimsical purple war dancer. The shield looks great, and the colorful meadow makes me happy. Paul B also did a happy little meadow for his ultra cool violinist. Red and yellow orange are included in her clothing and in the flowers. He doubled down on the coolness factor by making this diorama a rectangular summertime snow globe. Nice. Martin, aka Pebble, also rolled ultra cool. The other rolls were blue, blue again, and weathered. Fate demanded that this model be painted up like the Lich King, and Fate knew what it was doing. This looks awesome. I especially like the scratches and wear on the armor. Holly gets a shout out for the color palette on this druid. She chose to roll three color dice. She got green, blue, and red. She chose the perfect shade of each, and the effect is really pleasing. Picking the right palette will always pay off. Wendy tackled the steampunk challenge by cutting an old alarm clock in half. Clocks and gears, instant steampunk. It turns out that half of an alarm clock is a really good size for the backdrop of a mini. This is such an elegant solution to the punk theme. And my totally subjective pick for the grand champion of season 3 goes to... James and his Eversore Assassin. The dice told James to go for a spooky, personal best paint job using blue and purple. The longer I look at this piece, the more cool stuff I see. The blue and purple are delightfully subtle on the armor. The glowing green light is landing in fun places. There's a ton of neat stuff going on here, and I can't pull my eyes away. Congratulations, James. But don't get too cocky, you were almost beaten by this final honorable mention. A snotling stole a mushroom from the wrong fungal family. Will the snotling be able to escape from the green mushroom punk? Look at the mohawk on that big angry mushroom. That mohawk is how you know he's punk. Great job, Atlas. Victory was almost yours. For real, thanks to everyone who took part in this round of Goobertown Roulette. A new season is underway now. You can sign up to the Goobertown Patreon and then share your works in progress with the Goobers hanging out on the Discord server. Over the last year or so, this Discord server has developed into a really helpful and supportive community. Truly one of the best places on the internet. Alrighty, it's time for glamour shots of my roulette model. Here's the weathered tank. Let's swap in a custom turret and then put our dwarf behind the controls. I drew the white dwarf from my treasure bin. I rolled punk, I rolled weathered, and I rolled neutral colors. And this is what I came up with. I definitely got weathered, I did a decent job on punk, and I think I did an alright job on neutral colors. I was expecting the weathering to obscure the green tank and the orange beard a bit more than it did, but whatever, I still really like where we ended up. The modularity of this build is what makes me really love it. I can put the original turret on and we've got an awesome futuristic tank with swappable weapon options. Or I can give it a custom punk turret with a crazy dwarf as the driver. With the last few episodes of Goobertown Roulette, I've really gone overboard with painting extra characters outside the one I actually drew and putting them on elaborate bases. Believe it or not, on this project I attempted to hold myself back. 
I only painted one extra tank. I restrained myself from putting the tank in a landscape or putting other funky characters clinging to the hull. This tank is just a decorative base. And check this out. I don't even have to display the dwarf with the whole tank. If I wanted to, I could just take the turret off of the hull and use it as a heavily armed and heavily armored display plinth. I bought this kangaroo APC last year. Victoria Miniatures is a good company putting out awesome models, and I'm glad that I was able to find an excuse to finally paint this tank. Now here's the best part. I can swap the dwarf for almost any model on a 25mm base. I built the turret so I could use extra bases as spacers to raise or lower whichever character I want to use as the pilot. There are so many great options for pilots. Battle Gandalf. This guy. This guy. This lady. But here is the real winner. This is Johan's big day. The tables have turned and he's done running. He's still yelling and waving his hands, but now the hunted has become the hunter. It's Johan time. You never know what's gonna happen with Goobertown Roulette. I've had fun every time, but this time our friend Johan finally caught some luck. Remember this day. Alright, that's it for this time. Thanks to everyone who makes Goobertown Roulette so much fun, and thank you all so much for watching.